Listen to Herbert Marshall as the man called X. Wherever there is mystery, adventure, intrigue, in all the strange and dangerous places of the world, there you will find the man called X. Attention, citizens of Romania, Poland, Czechoslovakia. This is Radio Freedom. Attention, citizens of Bulgaria, Hungary, Albania. This is Radio Freedom bringing you the truth from free Europe. The truth that you behind the Iron Curtain can never get to hear in your own country. Attention, you workers in Kowlin Mines in Andrej. There is a security police... For over a year now, Radio Freedom has been broadcasting from Luxembourg in allied Europe to thousands of radio receivers behind the Iron Curtain, battling the big lie with truth, aiding the underground movements, telling the true story of the injustices, the imprisonments, the mockeries of freedom perpetrated in the name of the so-called People's Republics. But then, a month ago, the terror began to strike. In the home of a government worker in Sofia... at a meeting of underground leaders in Budapest. A party of refugees attempts to cross the Albanian Greek frontier. Here are the reports, Ken. Romania, Czechoslovakia, Poland. The same things happening in practically every country behind the Iron Curtain. How long has this been going on? About a month now. And if it keeps up, well, something will have to be done about radio freedom. Oh, now, wait a minute, Chief. Radio freedom is the biggest punch we can throw at the Kremlin, short of war. Not anymore, Ken. Not since it stopped broadcasting the truth. Since it started to give advice that turns into a death trap for anyone falling for it. Every one of these a result of radio freedom broadcasts? That's right. Huh? These people believe they were hearing the truth, took the advice that was given to them and ran right into the waiting arms of the security p- p- police. I just... A few I... more weeks of this sort of thing, and we'll never get those people to believe what we say again. That's why we've got to uh, yank that radio station off the air. Well, we can't afford it, Chief. We've got to get the truth across, now, before it's too late. But what other answer is there, Ken? Suppose I let you know. From Luxembourg. <laughs> Letters of introduction seem to be quite in order, Mr. Thurston. But I am not quite certain as to the reason for your visit here to Radio Freedom. I'd like some information, Miss Stebenek. You mean concerning our operations here? That's right. Well, as you probably know, we are a group of refugees from Iron Curtain nations, interested only in helping those of our countrymen who are under Soviet rule. We are financed primarily by donations from the American people, and we broadcast the truth as we know it. How much truth have we been broadcasting during the past month, Miss Stepanek? It is rather noisy in here. Perhaps we can talk more easily in my private office. Sure. You are a governmental agent, Mr. Thurston. You've read my letters of introduction. They are not specific as to that point. They're specific about the managing director of Radio Freedom giving me information. Very well. You are interested in the broadcast that we have been having so much trouble with to the very people we are attempting to help. What can you tell me about them? Only this. None of those broadcasts has come from here, from Radio Freedom. That doesn't make sense, unless you mean there's, a, there's an outlaw transmitter operating somewhere? Exactly. Someone in Western Europe is operating an illegal station, deliberately using the same wavelengths, the same format that we use on Radio Freedom. That station is the one that is broadcasting lies, confusing our listeners, ruining the reputation we have established for bringing them only the truth. You've got proof of that? We have caught the station on the air, have made recordings of actual broadcasts. Does it have a regular schedule? It can usually be heard around 8 o'clock at night. Where's it located? We do not know. (sighs) Haven't you ever heard of using directional antennae to locate a broadcasting transmitter? I have. Then what's been stopping you? Mr. Selston... 
What do you know about the Matterhorn? Why? The Matterhorn is a 14,000-foot peak of rock, snow, and ice in the Swiss-Italian Alps. There are a couple of shelter cabins on its slopes, nothing more. Yet our attempts at locating it tell us that the outlaw station is on the slopes of the Matterhorn. Ah. Yes, as you obviously realize, such a thing is a physical impossibility. In other words, the work of radio freedom is being destroyed by a radio station that does not exist. Yeah. Well, you've been most helpful, Miss Stepaniak. Thanks for your time. You are leaving? That's right. But you have told me nothing of your purpose in visiting here. Why you came, what you intend to do. Let's put it this way. Radio Freedom was organized to bring the truth behind the Iron Curtain. I intend to see that it does just that. Goodbye, Miss Stepanek. Wonderful country up here, isn't it, Mr. Thurston? I don't think I've ever seen anything approaching the majesty, the regal beauty of the Matterhorn. Have you been up here before, Professor Hartley? No, no. This will be my first visit to Zermatt. But my business has taken me to many other mountains around the globe. And just what is your business, Professor Hartley? It sounds rather adventurous and romantic. <laughs> I'm afraid not, Mr. Reader. I'm a weatherman, a meteorologist. Visiting Zermatt on business or pleasure? Oh, a little of both. The Italian government is establishing a weather station on the Matterhorn. They've asked me to check it over for them, make sure they've got it operating correctly. An Italian weather station? But you are visiting the wrong side of the mountain. <laughs> That's where the pleasure comes in. I thought I'd do a little skiing and climbing before going to work. Is that your intention also, Mr. Thurston? Something like that, Professor, yes. What about you, Mr. Reader? You up here for a bit of climbing, too? If you speak of the Matterhorn rather lightly, gentlemen, it is not a very wise attitude with which to approach one of the most dangerous mountain peaks in the Alps. Oh, that's hardly my understanding. Thousands of tourists have climbed it. And many have died trying. The cemetery at Zermatt will attest to that. Well, you make the mountain sound rather grim, Mr. Reader. Well, perhaps that was my intention, Professor. As a warning? If you wish. Why? You are not professional climbers. At this season of the year, an amateur attempting the Matterhorn is facing almost certain death. I take it you are, are a professional then, Mr. Reader? I have made it a philosophy of life, Mr. Thurston, to be a professional at whatever I may attempt to do. Well, we have reached so much, gentlemen. I trust your stay here will be a pleasant one. I'm certain it will be if you take my advice regarding the Matterhorn. Auf Wiedersehen. Watch your bag over here. Strange man, Mr. Reader. I wonder why he tried to confuse us. What do you mean, Hartley? Why make us believe he was a professional mountain climber when his business is connected with radio? Radio? What makes you think that? I noticed his baggage being placed aboard the train. He's brought a very complete shortwave radio outfit along with him. If you will please the signs, all right. Just turn mine here. Sure. There you are. Yeah, thank you. Welcome to the Gabelhorn Hotel, mine here, sir. Oh, thanks. Herr uh, Eckhart? <laughs> you, you called me Eckhart? Well, that's your name, isn't it? What is it uh, gives you that idea? We've met before. I do not recall sure it. Sure you do, Eckhart. 1944, Italy, above Casino. You were communications officer in the 8th Nazi Battalion. I'll tell it to get you after your capture. Oh, you are mistaken, sir. I have never been in Italy. I did not serve in the Nazi army, and my name is Abdol. Jörg Abdol. All right, Abdol. Have it your way. The war is over. Yes, yes, the war is over. You will be in the Zermatt long, Herr Thurston. Long enough to do a little climbing. Can you recommend a guide? Well, I usually recommend my own services as guide to... Uh, special guest. Good. Will you be free to make a climb tomorrow morning? I shall be free, but the Matterhorn will not. There's a storm brewing. Hmm? The skies look clear enough to me. One must learn not to judge by appearances in the Alps. 
On the Matterhorn, death often strikes without warning. The key to your room, eh, Thurston? I shall have your luggage brought in. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Abdo. Mr. What? Pagan! <laughs> That's right, Mr. X. Plenty glad to see me, Albert. What the devil are you doing here? <laughs> what a question. I'm going to help you broadcast behind the Iron Curtain. Snatch! <laughs> But it's just like I told you, Mr. X. There I was in Milan. That's in Italy, you understand. No. Oh, sure. And I was a little financially embarrassed for funds. Yes, so you called me at the bureau. That's right. Only you weren't there. No, but Miss Brooks was. Hey, gone, sir, help but me. But, Mr. Exeter, ought... can I help it if she goes for me and, oh, and tells me things? <laughs> anyway, here I am and here you are, and... Hey, what, what's the thing you got up, hooked up there? Anyway, eh? A portable shortwave receiver with a directional antenna. It is? But my... Hey, that's right. What's right? It's Tuesday night, around 10.30 New York time. Tune it in, Mr. X. Tune what in? Oh, that program I always listen to on NBC. Boy, what a screw-loose character they got on it. <laughs> you ought to hear his action. Yeah. Right now I'm interested in catching a broadcast from the Matterhorn. The Matterhorn? There is no radio station up there in that hunk of cold and ice. Denise Stepanich says different. Attention, citizens of Romania, Poland, Czechoslovakia. This is Radio Freedom. Quiet. Here Attention, it is now. citizens of Bulgaria, Hungary, Albania. This is Radio Freedom bringing you the truth from free Europe. The truth that you behind the Iron Curtain can never get to hear in your own country. But that's not coming from the Matterhorn, Mr. X. At the Cornball station that broadcast from Luxembourg. I know the dame's voice. So do I, Pagan. Attention. And Denise Stepanek. But that broadcast isn't coming from Luxembourg. Four. It's not. Land How do you know? Listen, while I change direction of the antenna. On route five, take alternate route two. So it gets louder. So what? Make your so escape. the directional antenna is pointing toward the Matterhorn. Attention That's where the broadcast is coming from. Oh, but how could that step in a cooker be up there in those mountains at night like this? And, and, and where could there be a radio station up there anyway? We're going to find out tomorrow. Huh? We'll take this set up the mountain with us. The directional antenna will lead us right to the transmitter. And then what? Then we destroy it. <laughs> but that don't make no sense, Mr. X. Did you hear what it was broadcasting before this music? I heard it. And I'll give eight to five that if those people in Berlin and Czechoslovakia follow that advice, they'll wind up dead. What? That's why we're going to destroy that transmitter. Make sure that nothing but the truth gets behind the Iron Curtain from Radio Freedom. Yes! Watch it! How oh, they came from out there on the terrace. Come on! But it's dark out there, Mr. X. It's Come dark. on! Okay, okay! That radio said some mess, eh, Mr. X? Who did it anyway? Whoever had those shots fired to get us out of this room. So how can you find that phony radio station without this direction stuff to help you? It's going to be tough. Hey, maybe you could send to Paris or somewhere for another gimmick. It'll take too long. We'll have to tackle the matter home without it. Now, what kind of a joke is that? You, you could wander around that mountain for weeks without finding anything but snow and ice. Or, or maybe snow. <laughs> you better just relax for a couple of days or two, Mr. X. Oh, sure. Hello? That you, Ken? Chief, what's up? Plenty. We just got a report from Radio Freedom. Somebody's gone through their files. There's some top secret information missing. What's Denise Stepanek got to say about it? She isn't there. Nobody's seen her for 24 hours. Huh? But that's not important right now, Ken. What is? That missing information. It's dynamite. 
Used the wrong way, it means the end of underground movements in at least three Iron Curtain countries. Then you can bet it'll be used the wrong way. Broadcast for that fake radio freedom transmitter? Sure. It's 100 to 1. They'll have it on the air tomorrow night. So what are you going to do about it? You know, Chief, that's a very interesting question. We'll return to the man called X in just a moment. No one knows the extent of defense preparations our nation must make in the future, but we do know this. For this year of 1952, the bill for Army and Air Force construction alone is estimated at some $2 billion, $4 million, and it's going up. Airfields, utilities, cantonments, radar stations, communications and navigational aids, fuel and lubricant depots, these are only a part of the long list of construction projects for defense. A typical radar outpost, just one of the many needed, costs in the neighborhood of two and a quarter million dollars. Now, it's easy to see that if America is to be strong in the men and weapons of defense, she must be strong financially. And that's where we can all help, through regular, automatic purchases of defense bonds through the payroll savings plan where we work, or the bond-a-month plan at our bank. Yes, defense is everybody's job today. Be sure your dollars are on the bond wagon. Every one you can spare. Now, Act Two of The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, with Leon Belasco as Pagan Zellschmidt. An illegal radio station located somewhere on the icy slopes of the Matterhorn has been destroying the efforts of radio freedom to broadcast truth to the countries behind the Iron Curtain. And Ken Thurston is faced with the almost impossible task of locating that outlaw transmitter within 24 hours in order to prevent it from broadcasting information that would mean the end of democratic underground movements in at least three of the Soviet satellite nations. And now Ken is walking toward a climber's rendezvous area outside his hotel at the foot of the Matterhorn. Looks like you're about to take a party up the Matterhorn, up there. That is quite correct, Thurston. Pretty risky, isn't it? Making the climb at night. My clients are paying me well, and I told you that part of my business was acting as a guide. Well, you also said you wouldn't act as guide for me in full daylight. Something about a storm coming up, remember? Oh, I must have been mistaken about that. Yeah, you must have been. Well, hello there, Mr. Thurston. I didn't know you were making the climb with us. I'm not so far, Professor Hartley. Well, there's no reason why you shouldn't join us. Isn't that right, Mr. Reader? Unfortunately, I do not agree with you, Professor. Why not, Reader? Don't you like my company? I don't care for amateur climbers. Yeah, I remember, mean, yes, you said that. Now, oh, wait a minute, Mr. Reader. The route we're taking isn't too tough. The mostly flat ledges, the shoulder, and down the Echel Jordan. I'm sure Thurston could make it with us easily enough. Perhaps, but I never undertake to guide for a party of more than two, Herr Professor. I shall be happy to accommodate Herr Thurston at uh, some other time. Oh, that seems to settle it, Hartley. How are you coming, Professor? I'm sorry, Thurston, but maybe you and I can make it in a day or two. Yeah, maybe we can at that. Good luck to you. Thanks. See you later. Yeah. For you? For you, Mr. Thurston? Boy. Have I ever got the red-hot scooperoo, Mr. X? What is it, Pagan? Guess who just came into the hotel looking for you? Denise Stepinek. That's right, Denise Stepinek. How did you know? Yeah, what's more important is how Professor Hartley knew. Huh? How he knew what? How to climb the Matterhorn. If he'd never been here before. <laughs> But it is as I said, Mr. Selston. I came to warn you about the information missing from Radio Freedom's files. Then why didn't you tell me five hours ago? Five hours ago? Yeah, when the last train arrived at Zermatt. What have you been doing since? Uh, that's a cinch, Mr. Thurston. She was broadcasting from that radio station somewhere up in the mountains. We heard her. That is impossible. I made no broadcast tonight. Then what were you doing for those five hours? I was trying to make up my mind as to whether or not I could trust you. Uh-huh. What made you decide in my favor? I realized I had no other choice. That illegal transmitter must be stopped from broadcasting tomorrow night. 
There is no one else to whom I can turn for help. <laughs> what a pack of lies, eh, Mr. Thurston? Could be, Pagan, but we'll soon find out. What do you mean, Mr. Thurston? We'll give you a chance to help us smash that transmitter. Then you do know where it is. Oh, sure. You told me back in Luxembourg. Somewhere on the Matterhorn. <laughs> Mr. Thurston, how can we find any radio station on this mountain? There's not a thing up here, not even page four. Cheer up, Pega. I think we've got some pretty good guides. Are you referring to that party climbing ahead of us, Mr. Thurston? That's right, Denise. Who are they anyways? Abdal, Rita, and Hartley. Do you know any of them, Denise? I know. Do they have some connection with all this? One of them must have. What makes you think that? That transmitter is going to broadcast information stolen from Radio Freedom. Somebody's bringing that information to it. And that part is heading for the Italian slope. You are right. But there's nothing over there either. Only a weather station and a couple of shelter huts. What was that, Mr. Thurston? Somebody up there fired a couple of shots. Shots? But what on earth for? Listen. Mr. Thurston, that noise. Where is it coming from? Look up there. An avalanche! It's an avalanche! Yeah, a concussion from those shots. But those areas, what do we do? What do we do? That ledge beneath the overhang. It's our only chance. Come on. people buried alive out there, and you tell me there's nothing we can do to help them. But there's nothing, Professor Hartley. Even if they survived the avalanche, that storm would prevent us from doing anything. We got to the shelter cabin through that storm, didn't we? We were merely fortunate, Hartley. Why attempt fate? You're a fine one to talk, Rita. You realize that if you had... Look, oh, The door. Yeah. yeah. It's all stuck. Here. Give me a hand with her. What? That woman first. Uh, she's all right. The shock and exposure. Close the door, Pega. Here, just put her down on this couch, you Yeah. Yeah. That's better. And you did make it. After that avalanche, I wouldn't have given a plugged nickel for your chances. Well, the main body of it went past us. And the overhang of a ledge saved us from the rest. You're a most fortunate person. It's not often the Matterhorn spares a victim that has marked for sacrifice. You know better than to blame this one on the mountain, reader. The Matterhorn didn't fire those shots. Are you accusing me of having deliberately started that avalanche? You got a better explanation? The true one. We could see the storm approaching from the Italian slope while you could not. I fired those shots to attract your attention to the shelter cabin. I had no idea the concussion might start an avalanche. Coming from a supposed expert on mountain climbing, that's a little hard to believe, Rita. Oh, but we'll skip it for now. How long do you think this storm will last, Abdul? Yeah. Perhaps 12 hours, perhaps 24. 24, Mr. Thurston. Uh, looks like we're going to be a little late. How is the storm now, Mr. Thurston? No sign of a let-up yet, Denise. And the time? 6 a.m., and that transmitter goes on the air at 8 tonight. We have only 14 hours left, Mr. Selston. Only 14 hours. Boy, listen to that thing outside. Isn't it ever going to stop? Doesn't look like it. Well, storm or no storm, I'm hungry. Must be time to eat lunch, eh, Mr. Thurston? Just about, Peg, huh? Just about. Well, I'd say the storm has finally quieted down enough for us to leave here, Mr. Opdahl. If there were daylight hours ahead of us, I would quite agree, Professor Hartley. But why risk traveling in for dark? It's already five o'clock. Five o'clock? Only three hours left. I suppose it does not make any difference now. 
You could be wrong, Denise. Might I inquire as to what you are talking about, Herr Thurston? Mr. Reader, we might be talking about how long it's going to take me and Pagan to get back to Zermatt. Boy, you're not serious. Well, after all, Updal's right. It's uh, practically suicide. Could be, Hartley. But you never know until you try. Come, Pagan, let's go. Gives anyways, Mr. X. We've been wandering all over this mountain joint, and I don't even see hide of that Zermatt place. That's not surprising. We're on the Italian slope. The Italian slope? But what are we doing over here? There it is. Just ahead. Huh? You mean that old ram shack? It's a weather station. Why do we want to go there for? No lights or nothing, and nobody's home. Hey, on, I have a hunch things will be different by 8 o'clock tonight. longer do we got to hide out in this closet, Mr. X? Just a few more minutes now. It's almost eight o'clock. Eight o'clock? You keep on talking like this was a radio station that was going on the air or something. Uh, you know, Pagan, you might be right. Huh? Hey. Hey, Mr. X. Yes. Someone came into the next room. But, but who? Why? Quiet. Hey, what was that? Generator's warming up. Generator? There's a shortwave transmitter in there, remember? Oh, that's right. But why does anybody want to... Attention, attention. Citizens of Romania, Czechoslovakia, Poland. This is Radio Freedom. Mr. X, it's the Denise Cookie out there. Quiet. Attention, citizens of Bulgaria, Albania, Hungary. This is Radio Freedom bringing you the truth from free Europe, bringing you the true story of what is actually happening behind the Iron Curtain. And tonight we ask you to listen more carefully than ever before. In just a moment, we are going to broadcast the most important message we have ever given you. Hundreds of people and lives may depend upon it, so please listen most carefully. All right, Pagan, that's our cue. Never mind the rest of that message. You can stop right there. First... That's right. Sorry to interrupt your little broadcast, but you're all through. But that is Professor Hartley. Where did that Denise Cookie go? She was never here, Pega. But we heard her just like we did last night. There was the recording machine. They'd make records from actual radio feed and broadcasts and play them back over this transmitter. Made them sound legitimate. Then Hartley and his pals would follow it up with their own version of the news. So, Hartley, looks like your little game is over. Not yet, Thurston. Mr. Ray! Don't try it, Hartley! All right, Pagan. Let's get him down to a doctor. Then we can start back home. And now, here's our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Thanks for being with us. And my thanks to Ida Rees Merrin, pardon me, Ida Rees Merrin, Will Wright, Bill Johnstone, Tony Barrett, and Ben Wright. Next week in Casablanca, Ken runs into a combination of airfields, spy rings, booby traps, and broken necks that pile up more trouble for him than, uh, well, than Leon Belasco, who'll be along, of course, as Pagan Zellschmidt. So join us, won't you, when next I return as the man called X. Good night. <laughs> The Man Called X, starring Herbert Marshall, is a J. Richard Kennedy production with music by Milton Charles. Tonight's story was written by Sidney Marshall. This program is directed by Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents on this program are fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. And now, until next week, same time and station, this is Hal Gibney saying good night for The Man Called X. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.